Um, I'm now super delighted um, to introduce our moderator for the next session, um, Howard Schimmel, president of Janus Strategy and Insights, who has a fantastic panel of converged TV measurement providers who are going to lead us through a discussion about one of the hottest and most important topics of the moment. How do we create scaled representative currency grade TV data sets in a phenomenally fragmented TV market? Howard, take it away. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, you're going to witness a master class in data management. I think of each of our five panelists as master chefs. They take different data sets, have different approaches for data integration and weighting and other key processes, and the result is a finely crafted data set that serves multiple pur purposes, including linear TV measurement, cross-platform measurement, and attribution. We've only got 25 minutes, so we're gonna talk about this at a very high level. This conversation could go on for hours. So let's get into our class. Um, let's start by having each of you guys introduce yourselves and your company and give us a brief description of your data stack and anything unique about how you integrate and report data. Caroline, can you start? Certainly, I should have guessed. You usually come to me first, Howard. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, it's fantastic uh, to be part of this conversation and thrilled to be with uh, a lot of my comrades here. Uh, um, 605, for those of you who don't know us, um, is a measurement and analytics company that uses uh, large scale device data and surveys um, to estimate television viewership and digital viewership. Uh, and uh, associate the response behaviors um, to the to those ads uh, that are viewed. Uh, we have um, a unique set of data um, that covers uh, primarily whole home. So we look at both set-top box and ACR and we combine them. We have a long list of methods uh, that we use as you, as you aptly put the chef, uh, bringing everything together. And we have a tech stack that is pretty impressive that supports the needed dynamicism at scale. Um, what we focus on for our clients is enabling them to tra transact on any advanced audience, any definition. Uh, so that basically sums up where we're, what we're focused on and um, our three unique attributes. Great, Josh. Thanks, Howard. Uh, I'm Chief Measurability Officer at VideoAmp. VideoAmp is a measurement company that combines, uh, I think we pioneered the notion of quote unquote commingling, uh, which is to say combining smart TV ACR data with set top box data uh, in order to take advantages of the strengths of each one to help mitigate the uh, shortcomings of the other. The paper that you and Gerard wrote for Sim uh, did a pretty nice job of pointing out how that is the case. Um, we have, um, uh, you know, we, we tie the data to an identity spine. We're doing uh, a lot of work uh, to develop uh, our, our, our implementation of the VIDs, the virtual IDs that uh, the ANA calls for. Uh, we're able to provide content and campaign measurement. We have data from four large, you know, four providers right now, and one smart TV, three uh, set-top box providers. The footprint will grow dramatically in the near future through the addition of one or more partners, uh, the names of which, of course, I, I, I can't speculate on, but you know, we can be waiting with bated breath for the big announcements. Cool, thank you. Michael. Thank you, Howard. Uh, I'm Michael Vinson. I'm the Chief Research Officer at Comscore. And uh, I, I spent a lot of time in the last uh, year or so thinking about the differences between panel and big data sources, and I've come to realize that it's a distinction without a difference. That in fact, what, the, uh, what we have is multiple data sources and spectrums along different axes of high touch, low touch, big data, small data. And really what we need, and, and Josh correctly identified this, that you need multiple data sources. There's no one source anymore that will, in any sense, you can even pretend is a representative, complete data set without gaps or data problems. And so at Comscore, we have linear television measurement with set-top box data. We have smart TV data connected to television. We have um, digital with both panel and census. And we have ways of commingling all these. Um, and the reason, you know, the reason this is such an interesting discussion is because there is no obvious way of doing any of this. It all requires data science, math, statistics. 
and, uh, and an appreciation for the differences among the data sets and the fact, again, that no one is enough. You need complementary data sets to get a complete view of what ultimately we're after, which is the measurement of the external reality of the audience of any given ad or piece of content. Okay, Vijoy. Hi, uh, Howard. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm the, uh, I'm, uh, the chief research officer at uh, iSpot. And uh, as far as iSpot goes, uh, we specialize in next day, uh, you know, audience estimates, both for uh, digital and uh, television, which you heard and uh, specified in the previous conversation. We do that through about 39 million televisions across the US. Um, we have an ad catalog of about 1.5 million, um, which is growing at about 6,000 a week. Uh, we pixel about 3,000 websites uh, and translates to about 600 million impressions, I would say. Uh, 164 networks are covered uh, at a national level. And um, the essence is basically bringing that together uh, uh, using a tech stack that is pretty fast. So we are able to service next day uh, viewership. And that's where we, we want to focus more and more in terms of actionability for cross-channel. Cross Got it. Mina, last but not least. Hey, good to see everybody. Thanks for the invite. Um, I'm going to keep it short. I lead the the measurement science or data science team and Nielsen, uh, we have a largely basically what I call, you know, two large corpus of data. One is panel, which most people are aware of, uh, high quality priority panel. And the next set of classes of data we call big data that includes RPD data, set top box or set top box or RPD, smart TV, which is ACR. And increasingly these two are converging to what I call an identity. That's a future for the measurement. So if you look at the corpus of the data is like, it's, a, it's about people-based measurement that leads to an identity that's interoperable across linear and cross platform. And that's where we are focused on. Thanks for the opportunity and good to see everybody. So thanks guys, thanks for the great introduction. So question for you. Um, you know, linear TV may not be the cool kid on the block anymore, but it's still a materially large part of Kershaw, Kershaw's and other people's businesses. Is there anything missing in terms of that you guys wish you had access to to be able to provide truly currency grade ratings into the marketplace? Anyone? I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that quick. So. Uh, we've been, and when I say we, I don't mean video amp, I mean the industry. We've been providing currency, currency grade data on linear TV, you know, since the 50s. Uh, what I'm looking forward to, though, is uh, the implementation of something like ATSC 3.0, so that we could get over the air TV to have a return path data stream. Uh, that's going to be exciting if and when it, it takes off sufficiently that we can take advantage of. Great. And I would take a slightly different tack to that. I think that one thing that is missing in a lot of traditional television measurement in the U.S. is uh, an awareness of the need for inference technology. And so mathematical techniques or statistical techniques that take indirect measurement, supplement it with direct measurement when available, and arrive at representative measurements as a result. And this is not, uh, it's not as simple as taking a probability sample and doing a very straightforward inference from that. It requires some uh, data science, um, a whole data, a whole technology stack to handle the data sources, and then a, a willingness to model and an understanding of different sources of error and the sizes and relevance of those sources of error. If I have a segment of the population that's say 1% of the audience, I can map model that pretty well and how wrong am I gonna be, right? Whereas if it's 20% of the audience, that's very significant. I have to spend a lot more effort to get that. And so I don't think it's necessarily a need for direct measurement in every case. There's a need for, again, variety of data sources to be able to make a valid inference that you can then validate and, and show to be correct. I would, um, uh, from my angle, I would say that, um, you know, increasingly we cannot assume that programs and ads travel together anymore, Absolutely. which uh, would mean that you need to measure them separately, right? And that's a unique challenge. One of the things I like about the digital world is they've built an ad ecosystem that is so strong I mean, you have partners, you look at the Lumascape, there are 3,000 plus companies that are focusing just on that. That creates a sort of a demand condition. I would love for the linear side also to, you know, step up to that level in terms of uh, measuring ad occurrence at the occurrence level 
uh, viewership as well as all the other audience metrics and the program. Both, both are important uh, from a content perspective as well as uh, advertiser perspective. I'd like to add my usual, which is that um, everyone's pointing at a different North Star. You know, there's a certain amount of you, um, universe estimates that we could gather together to agree. Um, I've talked about the ARF dash survey, um, you know, the market level definitions, the cross platform. You know, we don't have a credible um, source for all points of distribution. And those items would secure um, all of us to point at the same North Star. And uh, unfortunately, we're all pointing at different stars. <laughs> yeah, Caroline, that is a huge point. Uh, I was waiting for someone to mention yeah. it because, it, you Howard, know, I just wanted to add to that because I, I think that this is a, you know, you're talking about data and the platforms and so on and so forth. But I think at the end of the day, it's about people because at the end of the day, you're trying to reach media, the people and the count of, um, accurate count of people by ethnicity, population, by geography, because you know, set top box of subscribers, people who are subscribers on the coast. <laughs> so th there is a what I call understanding, really understanding about the size of the population you're trying to measure, and really not only household but actual person sitting in front of those screens, small and big, or out of home, or you know, over the air, these kind of population on trailer park and so on and so forth, which is about what 15 or 16 million people in the U.S. These are very important. I think you know we don't talk enough about the quality and the transparency of the size and the consistency of the population that you're trying to measure across different platforms and technology, which is continue, which is going to evolve, right? It's not a uh, constant. It is a constant evolution of that on um, that part. But to get that quality is very, very important. And I think um, you know that's when when I heard the previous you know set of discussions, and I think. Uh, it's great to have multiple data sources, but there has to be, to your point, Carolyn, this has to be a one North Star. You know, what is, there's a certain number of people who live in New York City. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, where I live, so you got to make sure that that's accurate and consistent and, and be, be able to measure and validate, which is another point. Yeah, and we don't need to argue it. Yeah. Yeah. We can, you know, that's the point is that we can come together and just agree that these are the definitions, um, and I'm, I'm really hoping the ARF will continue to pick up that baton and forward those that cause. Yeah, look, I think an important thing is it's not just the individual platforms, but it's the interlacing of the platforms. We need an accurate estimate of Hispanic households with cable who have smart TVs who use Hulu because those the, that that segment's viewing is going to be very different. All right, let's keep moving. Um, and and well, just one thing to my next point: it's not just households; it's also persons. Households yeah, yeah, don't right. watch television; people yeah. do. So, <laughs> last last linear TV question: um, we're going to be entering in a world where there might be five different, you know, six different providers or five different providers of ratings for the Super Bowl or ratings for. CNN in prime time. Is it your expectation that there will be minimal differences in ratings across the five of you? Do you expect there'll be pretty ma material differences? And if so, how, how do you explain the unique why your number is right? So that's a great question, Howard. And I think a lot of it comes down to the concept of cross-validation. So you have multiple, let's say in this case, multiple providers measuring a single external reality. Now there may be slight differences in what their frame is, whether they're including virtual MVPDs or they're not or whatever it is. But to the extent that they agree on what the measurement is, then ultimately we should converge to similar answers. That's, you know, the, there are more ways to be different than to be the same. If we two different providers or three providers give similar answers, measuring the same external reality externally uh, independently, then the chances are that they're measuring the same thing. And so I do expect that as all of us get better at what we're doing, filling the gaps and so on, I agree with Caroline about having some agreement on what the thing is that we're measuring, that'll be crucial. That um, uh, we'll have different strengths and it'll be up to the clients and customers ultimately to decide where the, the strengths lie and which company is doing the best job. But, <clears throat> Ratings uh, basically are estimates, I would say. So we are looking for similarities, not congruence, right? Um, and uh, from what we have seen, at least the numbers that we have, uh, you know, compared with what is available publicly, publicly available information, uh, are, 
you know, the estimates we see out there reported are within the margins of error of our estimates. So in that sense, you know, you're looking for similarity, right? The other thing is, I would say the industry has been very ad good at adapting to, uh, uh, you know, uh, revised benchmarks and norms, basically uh, re resetting benchmarks. So in that sense, I think we are used to it over the many, many decades of, uh, you know, uh, audience estimates. So I, I, I want to take a slight contrarian view here. Um, because I, I know there is a sentiment that if we can just standardize the data sets that people use and the identity constructs that people use, uh, everyone's going to come up with the same numbers. And uh, I, I want to say that I, I think that's an unreasonable expectation. It's been an expectation in audience measurement as far back as I can remember, you know, with uh, in the 80s and the 90s and creating a gold standard for print measurement. And then if we all just use the gold standard, we all come up with the same numbers. There are ingredients that we all have available to us that are crazy valuable ingredients, set top box data, crazy valuable, smart TV data, crazy valuable, useful, great signal. The universe estimate study that Caroline mentioned from the RF that her company and my company both chose to sponsor. Um, uh, but the um, you know census data, uh, the vid construct for identity. However, there are a myriad decisions. It, this is an art and a science. And you know, I hate to think of how many data scientists our companies combined have working on these challenges, right? And there, yes, there will be multiple currencies, but methodology and quality have to matter. They have to still matter. And I'm not suggesting that anybody here doesn't strive for quality, but I am suggesting that, uh, you know, it, it would be a bad thing if, if we wrote a document that says everybody has to do this exact list of things to the exact yeah. same list mm -hmm. of data sets to make the numbers. The way we're going to, you know, the fact that there are so many companies on this panel right now is a bonanza to this industry. Uh, the industry perhaps would like us all to show you the same numbers, but really the way, if, if that happens, then you're gonna live with that set of numbers and they're never gonna get better. The way we get closer to the truth is through com competition and transparency uh, organizations like the MRC auditing and crediting our services and driving mm -hmm. disclosure because so, it, yeah. there's yeah. pieces, but there's what we do with those pieces and that's always going to matter. I definitely agree with you, um, but I think as folks get educated about all those decisions that we're making, we're going to become slightly more aligned. Um, we're going to find that, you know, we're pointing north, um, as, as we keep on with that analogy, but I think as our, as we educate our clients and as we have our interactions and we see the, the differences in how our data responds or in comparison, that's extremely valuable for the whole industry, you know, to trust and to understand the techniques that are being put forward. So, okay. yeah, Howard, let me add a couple of things here, um, on the, multiple currencies and, and the, this discussion. I think it's a very interesting question. And uh, I heard the previous seg, uh, segment talking about multiple data sources. I think the validation is important. That doesn't matter how many data sources you have, you, sh you should be able to validate that and uh, op make it open and audit and so on and so forth. But you know, I think if, if you just, just take on one example, look at the financial market. There are multiple asset classes and secondary currencies, but in the end of the day, they're all tied to the dollar. Right. I mean, yeah. even crypto is tied to the dollar. Uh, so we, you know, we believe in a single transparent, trusted and quality metric that is important. It's very important to have one set of, set of metrics to accelerate buying and selling of the media and we are bidding on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah but I think the, ch the challenge is, imagine if you went to the stores in the United States and one day you use dollars and the next day you use euros. Exactly. I don't know, there, but, there's but, ahead, different use cases. So there's, there's the currency use case where people agree on a transaction and they're Yes, they have to agree on the currency, but there are other use cases for measurement, obviously planning, attribution, yeah. so on. And, and I think all of those things become very important. And one last, just quick comment about this, this different measurements and so on, is that we have to move away from point estimates and, and always include uh, estimates of error intervals or confidence intervals in order to understand, you know, are these two numbers, they appear different? Are they actually, maybe they're the same within statistical error, that kind of thing, I think will become increasingly important as people get used to having multiple currencies or multiple measurements. And, and, and the other thing is I can sell Michael something today 
with uh, euros, and Howard can sell Caroline something today with Bitcoin. As long as Michael and I are both using euros and you're both using Bitcoin, you can do that transaction right. with two different currencies, right? Right. I mean, okay. we have to remember that uh, the concept of notion of universal currency is only 60 years old, 70, 80 years old. I'm not talking about here, but the Britain Woods, uh, you know, dollar versus uh, other currencies part. Uh, increasingly, you see crypto and others coming in, and it's it's very valuable to see the that uh, uh, different parts of the world transact differently across. Uh, you know, so I, it, it enriches. It it doesn't take away, right? When you have uh, multiple modes available to advertisers and networks to to look at how uh, how well they're performing. The, the, other, the other thing I just want to toss out is that, and I know Michael knows this, I know Caroline knows this, only because we've worked together, that no matter how good your methodology is and how big your data footprint is, if you get a new partner, if you get a new data partner and you integrate that new data partner, the numbers are going to change. Does that mean you were wrong before and right now? Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, inputs have an impact on outcomes. Okay, so let, let's move on. Um, we have about five minutes left. The, um, so the title of today's event is Converge TV Measurement. Um, as you guys think about, obviously the data stacks that you've created not only serve a purpose of measuring linear, but also serve a purpose of being the underpinning of cross-platform. Um, you know, and, and again, you heard Kershan talk about the importance of that. How, is there anything in terms of how you've built these data sets where you worry about their use in a cross-platform world, either planning or measurement, or do you all feel like your data sets are ready for broad industry use for that those purposes? I think there's an importance of context. And, and Vijay, I mentioned this briefly, the, there's the ads and there's the content. And it's important to maintain the context of the ads because it can matter. I think there's a difference a different halo effect depending on whether you're in premium video or user generated cat videos. These things are important and have to, and I agree that, that the measurement may be different, the methodology may be different, but it has to be tied together as content and the ads move across the ecosystem through different channels. We need to maintain that context. Yeah, I would say that um, at 605, we're probably the youngest group on the, on the board here. Uh, and we started off with the premise that the television had to support the digital and addressable ads that came onto it and content. Um, but that was the premise and the, the decision to make sure that every impression was stored at a device and second level in order to enable all the layering of all the different content and the different target audiences with dynamic weights. So I would say that the premise was presumptive when we when we began uh, and it's it's a challenge no doubt with all the things that we're talking about we're not exactly exposing how difficult it is um, but uh, it's certainly how 605 uh, started their journey I'd, I'd say uh, unifying viewership definition across digital and uh, uh, linear is important uh, both from the program and ad perspective you take a 10 second ad that plays on Snapchat was a 30 second and the completion rate of each matter uh, essentially, right? Um, and so that's something that we need to uh, definitely get together on. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, my earlier point, like uh, it, it's increasingly important that we uh, provide actionable uh, information, both on ad occurrences and uh, uh, programming next day, next 48 hours, because I mean, it's the world is moving faster. Decisions are made, made faster, like, uh, and so, um, and that's another important area as well. Yeah, let me, let, Howard, I could add, I'll talk a little bit about Nielsen, but I think that the discussion gets confused between analytics and measurement. I think uh, it'd be good to kind of, in future to kind of clarify what is measurement versus what's analytics, right? I think to be just point is important to uh, really bring all this linear and digital together. And we launched a Nielsen one in alpha earlier this year, which really gives advertisers and publishers the ability to transact using metrics across linear and digital, uh, which is very important for total video consumption, uh, regardless of the platform and devices. And this is a single biggest thing we have been hearing consistently from our clients is the need for comparable measurement for of persons across the device. And I think that's, that's what Nielsen One tries to do 
but also not only that, to make sure it's the audience is deduplicated. So there's no lack, you know, no waste, not double counting and so on and so forth. And so they, it, I'm sorry, my, 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 uh, I'm and, sorry. And the last one I want to make, and I think that the important for the future, you know, going look, if you want to look at the future of the measurement, I think that three things um, are going to be very important. Consistency, comparability and coverage. I think if you if, if you are able to cover 100% of the video that goes across linear and digital, that's important, and be and be able to compare side by side different delivery systems and and uh, and platform as well. So those things are going to be important. Well, I just want to mention one quick thing, which I think is important because it's a, it's something of a game changer, right? Which is that we're all measuring linear TV, but I think we would probably all agree that the best source for measurement of streaming is the census data directly from the stream providers, right? So the question becomes, how can we incorporate that data into what I think of as a rating service, right? Uh, the, the owners of that data are rightly concerned about making sure that they permission it appropriately. Uh, but that changes the dynamic in terms of planning tools, for example, because it's very difficult right now to offer a total footprint content planning tool where you've got everybody's streaming data and everybody's linear data so that you can see before a campaign runs what audiences you might expect. So uh, I'm, I'm curious to see how we collectively solve that problem. And particularly deduplicating across those services, right? Tom? Yeah, that's what we're, that's the, that's the challenge we're left with, right? Is how to deduplicate once we get our hands on the data. That's correct, yeah. And be able to validate it with real, you know, it's a real, mm -hmm. it's people-based measurement. It's not devices and screens, you know, those are log machine to machine data. <laughs> so you could take that, you could, you know, parse out, but at the end of the day, you have to tie it to a real person like you and I, right? So that's, that's the ultimate validation that we need to look for. I would say that the ultimate, for me, the ultimate validation is it's tied to a transaction or a mm. outcome. Well, I want to thank everybody for a great discussion. We could have gone on for hours. We should probably do that. Again. Yeah, Howard, next time get us three minutes. Yeah, there we go. All right, uh, back to John. Thank you. Howard, Josh, Michael, Caroline, Bijo, and Manek, thank you for a fantastic panel. Um, I would like to flag that um, as part of our program during the months ahead, we are absolutely planning to run some longer, more detailed discussions on these themes. So stay tuned. We will be publishing a program and schedule very soon.